there is a significant amount of wear and it's a significant deep bite. Right? This is a different scenario altogether right now because we can't just go ahead and align these teeth. These teeth are, there's not a significant curve of speed here. They're not sitting way high up, but unless we intrude those teeth, there's no room for us to actually build them up. So we need to intrude them and we need to intrude them a lot. And we need to intrude our uppers if we wanna line up our gingival margins to make things even, right? So significant chipping and wear occurring on these teeth in rough, rough shape. We look at this patient's balance here, his facial balance, right? He's got a, a decent bite in terms of the strength of his bite for sure. You can see the notching down here on the ceph. Now you don't need a ceph for um, an adult patient like this, unless you're in Quebec, but we still take cephs to get a, an, an understanding in, in some cases of the facial balance, but in a lot of cases we don't take cephs on adult patients. And one thing that's interesting is that if you look, he actually didn't do any treatment for a while. So if we actually compare, this is about a year later, look at his one, two, his upper right lateral incisor. This is where it was a year prior, right? Nice and flat, kind of there's the edge of it. And then you look a year later and you can see how much more chipped and worn this tooth is. So whether it's taking photos or taking an iTero scan, I think there's a lot of value about being able to show patients the continued progression of what's happening. And again, it's crazy, it blows my mind that a patient like this, you ask him, did you know that you grind and chip your teeth? And he's like, really? Nobody's taken the time to talk to him about the fact that his orthodontic issues have resulted in a lot of these problems. So other things to note, right? He looks to be pretty class one, maybe a little bit class two, but pretty class one. Lateral incisors, if we compare those to his lower teeth, his lateral incisors on the uppers might be a little bit small, but nothing too crazy. Right, we can see there's a bit of asymmetry maybe between his upper left lateral incisor and his upper right lateral incisor. Okay, so that's the general assessment. Let's go ahead and take a look at the plan. But, and same thing guys, this is the thing that's crazy. Nobody's talked to these patients about these things and really brought them up. And when you actually present them and you show them similar situations, show them that case library, show them the, the issues and the problems and the, the damage that's happened to those teeth of other patients and the changes. And he looks at the last patient's case and he says, yeah, I want that for my teeth too. I want to have beautiful teeth. And I'll, uh, spoiler alert, he's going to have beautiful teeth at the end. What are we looking at on the ClinCheck here? Now, one thing that's a little bit different, that again, if you want to know more about how to do this, I teach this a lot through the Clearly Aligned courses. I'm not going to go into it in significant detail right now, but we actually plan and design a lot of lingual attachment cases. We're replacing the attachments on the inside, so when he's smiling and showing his teeth throughout treatment, He's never actually really showing. This is what it looks like. This is part way through treatment, giving you a bit of a spoiler, but at no point does he show any anesthetic attachments, which is a big selling point for a lot of patients. So I teach about that technique in attachments and biomechanics. We can see when we look from the side view here that he's actually a little bit more class two than what it kind of looks like in the photos. His premolar teeth are hitting a bit heavier against each other instead of kind of biting interlocked perfectly between hitting the lower premolar and hitting that lower molar. When we look at his Bolton analysis, he does have a bit more of a Bolton. So it's showing that his lower incisors, his lower three to three, has a 1.42 Bolton, which just means that the lower arch is a little bit bigger in proportion than it should be. Well, when we look at his case though, we can see that he doesn't have uh, a perfect class one occlusion, right? Again, if it was perfect class one occlusion, this canine tooth should be biting perfectly between the lower canine and the lower premolar. So it'd be more, kind of in this area here. So he's a little class two, nothing crazy right now. But because of that, I'm not gonna go ahead and do IPR right off the bat. However, in the treatment plan, in the initial treatment plan, treatment plan number one, it's actually programmed in for us to do a lot of lower incisor IPR. But our Bolton discrepancy was not more than two millimeters. He's a little bit class two. He's not perfect class one and he's not class three. And so for that reason, that's why we made the decision to say, let's let's go one round, let's see what happens. Let's say he ends up with a bit of a posterior open bite. He's hitting heavy in the anteriors. Okay, we'll do a bit of IPR. We'll intrude those teeth more, right? We'll work on it. So that's the first thing that I want you to see here in this initial treatment plan of what first came back to us. The second thing you can see is that we're intruding the teeth. So the lower incisors are intruding, but are they intruding enough? And are the upper incisors even? Right, let's just look at something basic, like the gingival margins of our upper incisors. So where our final position is right now, I would say that our canines aren't ideal. Our laterals are actually higher up than our centrals. And so we need to plan in more intrusion on those teeth. So how would we do it? Again, I'm just gonna show you here on a demo clean check. You would grab that tooth, you would push it up, 
right? You'd line up the gingival margins on all those teeth so that you're happy with them. Of course, we're making this look pretty weird. And then you'd click live update or you'd hit submit plan. That was it. That's all you need to do. It's super, super straightforward. It's super easy. You guys all can make that happen. You need to train yourselves to be familiar with the software and understand how it works. And, and we're here for you for that. So that's the thing that I notice here is I don't feel like his incisors at the end of this first round of treatment are in the right position. I feel like they all need to push up more. So I make those manual changes. Here's the new treatment plan. So with that intrusion, this looks much better. I could have planned his in, uh, the gingival positions to be a little bit lower on his lateral incisors if we wanted to, right? This is now in your control. You choose how you want those gingival margins to be positioned. On his lower incisors, we started off in a like 100% deep bite. And when we finish, we're actually finishing in an open bite. Well, why is that? That's because we actually wanna go ahead and plan space in here to do the restorative work. In reality, we probably need to even plan more intrusion than what we've seen. What's super, super, super important right here in these treatment plans though, is to make sure that we have good, strong, retentive attachments on the lower premolars. So this is treatment plan number one, which does have them. Let's just look at the lowers by themselves, right? We have a three millimeter and a four millimeter horizontal attachment, and two four millimeters. We could have also placed on like a optimized deep bite attachment or support attachment would have also helped because the active surface that's locking the trays in is the gingival surface. Right, so that the actual part on the attachment that matters is that we have a nice, thick, juicy spot for the trays to lock in on the gingiva. So that's gonna be right here. Angle doesn't show this as well, but right here and right here. And so when the trays are now pushing, what's gonna happen is we're trying to intrude our lower incisors. So where is the tray pushing these lower anterior teeth? And let's jump to number four because you're gonna see how much more we're intruding these teeth. The tray is gonna be pushing down in the anterior region. So it's pushing down on the incisors right here in the canine. Well, that means that it's gonna try and lift up. You probably have had this before. I'm assuming everybody has had this situation that you are seeing a patient, they talk to you about their, their trays and they're like, oh, they're super uncomfortable. They're bouncing in the back. And you're like, why are they bouncing? I don't know, we, let's try squeezing them. Let's get you a refinement, let's do something else. Well, a lot of the times the issue is just that you need to go ahead and have attachments in the posterior to help support intrusion that's trying to happen in the anterior. Because as you are pushing down in that anterior region, the posterior of the tray, it's trying to lift up. Okay, so it's pushing down in the anterior region here. The tray is trying to lift up in the posterior. So it's trying to pop off the teeth here because it's pushing down so much on those anterior teeth. And so in order to get the tray to force the tray down, you need to have a good attachment there to snap into and lock the tray into place. And as long as you have good attachments in that posterior region, then the tray is gonna try and lift up or it's gonna try and lift up on those surfaces. So it doesn't matter if it's conventional or it's uh, optimized or whatever, you just need to have something good to prevent that tray from lifting up so that it snaps in place and it can put proper forces down in that anterior region. Because if it does just lift up like you're seeing in that with that pink line, it's not gonna be pushing down on those incisor teeth. It's just popping off on the back. So those are kind of the key takeaways that I want you to have from this first clin check. Now, the question is, people ask me, well, what happens if you end up intruding? Like, Steven, this is pretty open. What happens if you do too much? <laughs> well, I'm gonna show you. <laughs> so let's go ahead and jump to where we're at at our refinement. So we've intruded those teeth. One thing that's kind of interesting to note is that he's actually a little bit more class two than his photos or his original ClinCheck really showed. A at first glance here, he looks more like he's class one, but in reality, he's actually a little bit, po he's posturing, he was posturing a little bit. So he's actually a little bit more class two. Is that a problem? I mean, I'm not super worried about it because to be honest with you here, that's not really our chief concern. That's not where we're focused. Our focus right now is on intruding the anterior teeth to do restorative to help build up and prevent that from getting worse. So do I care if he finishes a little bit class two? I mean, sure, it'd be ideal if he's perfect class one, but that's not really the, the main goal that's super important in this situation. We talked about how he has that slight bolt and discrepancy, but if we look at his overjet, and we can again click on the tools tab to look at the overjet, I'll pull that over here, and we can actually see that he still has a 3.3 millimeter overjet. So I'm not too worried then about doing IPR on his lower incisors because the lid and the box, they're fitting well enough together, in part because he's a bit class two. So not a huge concern. Okay, so he's propped open a little bit maybe on uh, those attachments, which is fine, we, we know that, that's all right. But what we notice is, is that his 2-1, his upper left central, it's maybe positioned with the root going tapering more towards the distal, 
and he has distal root tip. So we're gonna wanna go ahead and try to get that tooth into a better spot. Now, one thing that I do when I use these lingual attachments is I tell the patient, hey, on the first round, we're gonna put all the bumps on the inside. That's where we're gonna start. Then if we need to put a bump on the outside, we'll do it. Our goal is to give you the best possible result. So now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna work on creating mesial root tip on that tooth with this next batch of aligners. And if we look at the lower gingival margins, we're gonna intrude those teeth as well to line up those gingival margins to give us even more space for us to do the restorative. Now you'll notice, keen eye observers, there's a lot of trays here. Now again, I, I'm, I don't have the time or the ability to go into this as much as I would love to, because it's one of my favorite topics with talking about lingual attachments, but lingual attachments function differently. Lingual attachments have different rules and parameters and speeds and velocities of how quickly you change your trays. And at our office, patients who are using lingual attachments, due to a number of reasons, they actually change out their trays twice a week. So they change their trays out very frequently. So when you see 40 aligners right here, this does not mean 40 weeks or even 80 weeks if you were changing out every two weeks. Instead, this means about four months worth of trays. After the movements have happened with that attachment, so going back here, the very beginning to, of this batch, to where he's at at the beginning of his next batch, we've managed to upright that tooth a lot more and the root is in a much better position. Okay, our gingival margins, they're getting better. We still have a little bit of work to do on them on the upper and the lower. So our next plan, we're going ahead, we're doing a little bit more intrusion. This is in combination now with the restorative dentist. They're involved in the equation at this point. Okay, and again, if we think that we're gonna do too much, you can always just have the patient stop. They don't need to wear all of these aligners. They could stop before they get to that point. Okay, because I want to go ahead and show you the photos here. Let's take a trip down memory lane of where we started. So 100% deep bite, really challenging position. Look at that change just from the first batch of aligners. Insane intrusion. It looks great. Here's where we're at after the second batch. We still need to work on our gingival margins more and intrude those centrals more. Here's where we're going to be at now after our third batch. So you can see that maybe we're starting to overdo it a little bit. This 2-1. Right, we need to change the position of that 2-1. It's maybe a little bit too high now, and we still need to work on the, the tip a little bit. So what are we gonna do then? We're just gonna go ahead and we're gonna bring that 1-5, or sorry, that 1-1, one, uh, one, one, maybe back down a little bit. If it's a bit too high now, we can just go ahead with our next batch of aligners and just bring it back down a bit. Right, we're just extruding it back, letting it essentially relapse a little bit. A little bit more tweaking on our lower incisors just to make sure those gingival margins are, are great. Honestly, guys, you could have stopped this case like after the first clin check almost and done the restorative and it would be great. We're really focused on getting those details as close to perfect as we can. And even then, I'll still always look at things that I didn't do as well as I should. You, you would be doing this patient a huge service by stopping even after the first round of trays and, and moving into um, move, getting the restorative work done. Okay, so this is where we're at. We allow that tooth to come down a little bit more, level the gingival margins a bit, I never did quite get the central incisors quite as high up as I would like. I would like for them to be a little bit more symmetrical with his upper canines, but the upper centrals are a little bit higher than his laterals. So I'm, I'm fairly pleased when you look from, again, our initial position to here, I'd say that's pretty good. And then it's time for restorative. I wanna give you a super critical, important point here. Write this down, commit it to your memory. Don't forget it. Do not, I repeat, do not take off your attachments before the appointment for the restorative. I have made this mistake maybe once or twice in my life and never again. Leave the attachments on the teeth. And in this case, they're on the lingual side, right? So we've got these lingual attachments right here, or if you had them on the buckle, whatever, leave them on, take them off the day that you do the restorative. You do not want for those teeth to start extruding down because you took off the attachments and they start to relapse. Because once you go ahead and you do the restorative treatment, now you have an incisal stop. You have occlusion occurring on those incisal teeth and that they won't continue to extrude, right? Because there's something stopping them from extruding. But if you go ahead and you take off all those attachments and the patient gets lazy and they come back two or three months later saying, I'm finally ready to do my fillings, you're in trouble. You're in a lot of trouble. And those teeth have extruded down and all that hard work you just did, it's all, maybe not all gone, but a lot of it's gone. So do not, do not, do not take off those attachments until you are at the point that you're ready to do the restorative. The other thing is, is that patients will want to get their attachments off. And so they're going to be asking you, when can I get my restorative done? 
So normally what we would do is we would start whitening the patient because the restorative, once you do it, you can't change the shade. So you need to start doing some whitening while they're in treatment. So they can either whiten in their Invisalign trays. It is a, uh, a myth, a complete myth, that you cannot whiten while you have attachments on your teeth. 100% you can whiten while you have attachments on your teeth. It is not going to cause spots around those attachments because the way that whitening works is that it soaks into the tooth. It's not painting a fence where if you didn't clean the fence off properly that it's not gonna work. The whitening will work with attachments on the teeth still. So make sure that you leave those attachments on, do the whitening, then go ahead, do the restorative, take off all the attachments right before you do the restorative, do the restorative. This is beautiful work done by Dr. Hannah Cho at our practice. She's an artist when it comes to this stuff. Then go ahead and you're gonna either have to do one of two things. One is that you're gonna take the last tray and you're gonna cut it. You're gonna cut the incisal edge off so that all of these teeth that just got the fillings are poking through the edge of the tray. Or option number two is you are going to make them an in-house Essex or you take a quick scan, send it to your lab, get the lab to make them a same day Essex or maybe by the next morning in Essex and then get that Essex in. So obviously beautiful results at the end of the ortho, at the end of the restorative, comparison with where he first stopped. 